you guys excited about Easter coming up? <laughs> this person is. Hey, can I let you in on a little secret? Can't, yeah, all right, I was going. Jesus is alive today, too. You're welcome. <laughs> that was free. That's bonus material right there, Ray. Hey, I want to, before we get into the Word today, um, and before I have you turn to James chapter 3, look in your, the seat back in front of you, and I want you to find these Easter invite cards right in front of me. Come on, everyone find them, and I want you to actually take them out of the seat back and hold them in your hand. And you know, what Pastor Eddie was saying is true. God really is on the move at Rev City. God's doing something here. God's doing something special. Can I tell you, he's pouring out his spirit here. And uh, last week I preached a message about the power of servanthood, how the pathway to greatness in God's kingdom is through servanthood, through serving others. And I, I preached a message about serving, and I'm telling you, eight or ten people gave their life to Jesus Christ at the end of a message about serving. And I, I'm just telling you, it, it, yeah, that, that's worth celebrating. Come on, lives changing. Listen, here's what I'm saying is that uh, it's, it's about the spirit of God, that God is moving in our midst. And people are coming to know him, and people are giving their lives to him. And how do you know that's what really matters, amen? And so I, I, wanted, I wanted you to just take these cards in your hand, and I want to encourage you with something. These three cards that you have in your hand represent three people in your life. And when Easter rolls around, people in your life, come on, friends, family members, co-workers, neighbors. Easter Sunday rolls around, people are more likely to be responsive to an invitation to come to church. And so I wanted you to hold this in your hand, and I wanted, I just felt the Holy Spirit just in, uh, put in my heart to take a moment, hold these in our hands, and pray over them. And just activate faith for what these represent. An invitation to a precious person in your life who maybe today is far from God, or maybe today has drifted from God. Maybe they know they need God, maybe they don't even know, but that this represents an opportunity to go and just say, hey, Easter Sunday's coming up in a couple Sundays, would you go with us? Would you meet me there? Would you come and experience what God's doing at Rev City? So come on, would you take those in your hands and would, as I pray over them, right there where you sit, would you pray over them and just activate faith for who they represent in your life? And so, Lord, we thank you for uh, the fact that you are moving in our midst. You're, you're drawing us nearer. You're drawing us closer. You're leading us deeper, Lord. You're, you're moving every Sunday and people are responding to the preaching of the gospel and giving their hearts and giving their lives to you, Lord. And we recognize it's not because of anything that we could do. It's because you are here and because you are moving and because you are showing up, Lord, because you are stirring hearts and softening hearts. And Lord, we thank you for the celebration that's coming up here in a couple of weeks. And we remind ourselves it's about Jesus. It's about celebrating the fact that you loved us so much. You loved the world so much that you sent your only son to die on that cross and to raise again, that those who believe would not perish but have eternal life. And so we anticipate, God, that you're going to move mightily on that Sunday. And we thank you, Lord, for the next couple of weeks that you would lead us, that you would stir our hearts, that you would create divine appointments, Lord, that you would, would bring someone to our remembrance, that you would bring us across someone's path, Lord, that you would give us the faith and the courage, Lord, to speak up and to invite someone to come and to hear the good news of Jesus Christ on Resurrection Sunday morning. What a privilege it is, God, that we get to serve as your hands and feet. What a privilege it is, God, that we are entrusted with the message of hope, the message of life, the message of freedom, the, me the message of resurrection power. And thank you for the privilege of inviting others to come and experience who you are and what you do in our lives. And all God's precious and handsome people said, amen, 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 amen. So thank you for taking those and just being led by the Lord and being obedient to invite people to come and experience Jesus this morning. If you have your Bible this morning, turn to James chapter 3. Turn to James chapter 3. Man, you guys are looking good this morning. Woody was right. Come on, turn to a neighbor this morning and just say, you're looking good. Turn to your other neighbor who was your, your second choice and, and ask him, have you lost weight? Doesn't that feel good? All right, we're continuing this morning in our series, 10-Year Challenge. And the inspiration behind the series was that thing that 
went viral on social media where a lot of my family and friends and celebrities were posting images of themselves from present day alongside one from about 10 years ago. And it just began to inspire me with the reality that our life, your life, will look different. 10 days, 10 weeks, 10 months, 10 years from now, your life is going to look different. Your life, in every area of your life, your life is going to look different. And that there really are only three true realities. There's a, there's a huge variance of outcomes in between, but there really are only three true outcomes for every area of your life. That you'll be closer to God, that you'll be further from him, or that you'll be stuck the same. And I'm telling you, people of God, it's what I've been challenging us with throughout this series. There's only one acceptable outcome for me. Every area of my life, my heart, my mind, my marriage, my family, the things that God has entrusted to me, the things that God has called me to put my hands to, that I would be closer to the Lord Jesus Christ. That I would be more aware of his heart, his word, his will, his ways in every one of those areas. That I would not drift, that there would not be spiritual erosion in my life, and that I would not become complacent and allow myself to become stuck where I am today. That I would press in to more of God. And the pathway to the more, the new, the next of God is always faithfulness with the now of God. And God has a vision for your life. But what I've been challenging us with all throughout this series is that the pathway to your life vision is paved with daily decision. And so that's what we're talking about is the decisions we make and the steps that we take to begin to move forward to the promises and the plans that God has for you in every area of your life. And every week before we've gotten into the message, we've taken some time and just shown some 10-year challenge photos from you guys, from some of our church leaders. And there's a couple of precious couples that I want to take a look at this morning. The first one, I believe, is Ray and Imee Poteet. There's Ray and Imee. Come on, give it up for Ray and Imee. <laughs> Such a handsome couple. There they are having fun together. Ray, you married over your head, man. Speaking of, of marrying there, they are on their wedded, wedding day. Which one's Ray? <laughs> oh, I see, I see right there, Ray, Ray. Amy's right there on Ray's left, you're right there. I don't know what's going on there, and I don't know that I want to know. <laughs> oh, that's funny. What is happening there, Ray? 40th anniversary right there. Wow. Come on, give the Lord a hand for that. Hey, and that, that was a few years ago. How many years have you guys been married as of today? 51. Come on, one more time. Give the Lord a clap. Next we have Woody and Marla Davis. There's Woody serves as an elder. He stood this morning, led us in communion. Yeah, give him a hand. There they are on their wedding day. Woody, you're looking handsome, brother. <laughs> there they are once the Lord had added to their family. Three handsome boys there. And God's continued to add to their family. Yeah, he's been faithful, huh? That was the inspiration for Toy Story right there, Woody. <laughs> Woody. Isn't his name even Woody in Toy Story, the Calvin? There's Woody on the left right there serving in the United States Navy. Come on, give him a hand for his service. And there's Woody on the right. I asked him, I said, Woody, do you, is there a picture of you, that, of, of you in short shorts and tall socks? And he delivered. There he is right there. Come on, where, where is that? When, when and where is that? Do you remember, Woody? Uh, that's in Milwaukee. Uh, had to be in the 80s sometime, right? Yeah. Come on, give it up for Woody and Marla and Ray and Imee. <laughs> Hope you've enjoyed that, just uh, and taking, taking a few moments to just experience that. And so there's really only three true outcomes, that you'll be closer to God, further from him, or stuck where you are today. The pathway to the vision that God has for you. And he wants you to have a vision. Proverbs 28 says that you perish. People perish without a revelation, without a vision. We begin to get a dream for our life. We begin to apprehend what God has to say about life and what he's leading us to. 
Jeremiah 29, 11 says that he has a good plan for you. He has good thoughts towards you. He has, he has a hope. He has a future for you. And so he wants you to have a vision. And it begins, it says, that, that scripture says, without a vision, people cast off restraint. But when we begin to know God has a plan, a good plan, good thoughts of hope and a future, we begin to live differently. We, we, we begin to live intentionally. We begin to make different decisions. And that's what this whole series is about. It's about making decisions that align us with the will of God and the heart of God for our lives, for our marriage, for our home, for our kids, for our family, for what he's called us to put our hands to, for our workplace. The pathway to your life vision is paved with daily decision. And so as we're ramping down in this series, I begin to just say, Lord, what, what are some of the things that just practically I could begin to just unpack for us as a church family that are real, real tools that we can put in our toolbox to begin to discover and not just discover, but begin to experience and enjoy those things that you do have in your heart for us. And he began to just speak to me that our life is largely comprised, the life that we lead is largely comprised of the thoughts we think, the words we speak, and the company we keep. And so a couple weeks ago, we talked about the thoughts that we think, that the Bible says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. Another translation says, to the behaviors and customs of this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so we talked about how significantly important it is that we begin to, to, be, to break free from the way the world thinks. And we begin to allow the Lord to begin to renew, to transform us, rather, by the renewing of how we think. In fact, a, 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 the New Living Translation says it so clearly. Let God transform you into a new person, person by changing the way you think. And then right there in the shadow of that verse, it says, Then you will know, learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So listen, we're saved by grace. But we're transformed by the renewing of our mind. This is important because your thoughts, listen, the thoughts that you think, thoughts become words. And words inspire actions. And actions have a way of turning into habits. And the habits that we develop affect our character. And the character of our life affects our destiny. All starts with thoughts. The thoughts you think, the words you speak, and the company that you keep. Listen, having a thought is not a sin. Having a thought is not a sin. We can't always control the birds that, that fly through our lives. But I'm telling you this morning, people of God, we have something to say about which ones build the nest. We have, we, we have, we have a say about which ones t put, take up roost within our mind. The Bible says that we can take every thought into, the, into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So thoughts become words. And I want to talk to you this morning about the words you speak. The words you speak. Listen. Again, having a thought is not a sin, but the reason it's important is because thoughts become words. And men, you need to listen to me this morning. When your wife asks, do these new pants make me look fat? No. The answer is always no, Ray. We have a winner. <laughs> no, listen, the thought that you have is not sin. It's when that thought becomes a word that's when you have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I mean, am I right? Like, I mean, even if you look and it's like, well, they're not the most flattering. I mean, I mean, and how, how many of you ladies want us to be real honest when we ask, when you ask us that, by the way? We'll just do it. Take a moment. I don't see many hands. I see a few, though. I see a few. How many of you would say you want us to be honest, but when we're honest, you want to kill us? <laughs> so the thought that you have is not a sin. It's the word that you speak. It's, when, you, it's when, you, when that thought becomes a word. Listen, the words that you speak are affecting the direction of your life. Look at what James chapter 3 has to say. Starting in verse 3. And it says, when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and they're driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder. Wherever the pilot wants it to go. Likewise, come on, say likewise. The tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. It says it, it determines the course of 
your life. It determines the course of your life. Listen, this is a, this is a, 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 a challenging scripture. And it goes on, it says, all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full, full of deadly poison. Now, let me just stop and interject something right there. What this Bible scripture says is true. No human being can do it. But you can do it by the power of the Holy Spirit. You can't do it in your own strength. But God didn't leave you to your own devices. He sent the power of the Holy Spirit. And you can't do it in your own strength, but you can do it by the power of God. And it says, with the tongue we praise our Lord and our Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. And out of the same mouth comes, come praise and come, come cursing. The same mouth that comes to church and sings, how great is our God. Goes home and complains and grumbles and criticizes and fault finds. He says, my brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. And listen, I want to make a challenging statement to you this morning, people of God. What you actually say, what you actually say with your mouth, what you actually say matters more than what you say you believe. Let me say it again. What you actually say matters more than what you say you believe. That's what he's saying right there. He's saying blessing and cursing. How does that come out of the same mouth? You say you love God. You say you want to serve God. But how, how, how does what you're saying is not lining up with what you say you believe? What you actually say, what we actually say matters more than what we say we believe. It's affecting the direction of your life. It's affecting the course of your life. James says it's like a bit that, that allows us to steer an animal. It's like a rudder that's a small rudder and steers a mighty ship. It's determining the direction of your life. Now turn, turn uh, back to Numbers, to the Old Testament, chap Numbers chapter 14. I want to share with you a powerful story that underlines the powerful importance of the words that we speak. Listen, you need to hear, th hear this this morning. This is important. This is important. This is important. And we're saved by grace, and we're on our way to heaven, praise God, because of Jesus Christ. But the, the direction of our life and the quality of life that we enjoy is largely affected by the words, by the thoughts we think, the words we speak, and the company that we keep. Are you there in Numbers chapter 14? Yes. Come on, if you're there, say Amen. Starting in verse chapter 1, it says, That night all the members of the community, this is the people of Israel, who've been delivered in supernatural ways from the, from the bondage that they were experiencing in Egypt under the hand of Pharaoh. And now they're on their way towards the promised land, and it says they, they raised their voices and wept aloud. And all the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, I want you to catch this, these are words that are coming out of their mouths. If only we had all died in Egypt or in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and our children will be taken as plunder. It hasn't even happened yet. They're already speaking it. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? Can you, are you kidding me, people? And they said to each other, started as a thought, became a word. We should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. I mean, really? Are you kidding me, people? Isn't that just like us, though? I mean, we, we, we become comfortable with our bondage. And God wants to set us free, but we, it's kind of a comfortable place that we desire to go back to. Sometimes it's easier to go back to Egypt than it is to forge ahead to the new things that God's leading us towards. Come on, that's what this series is all about. I'm not getting stuck where I'm at, and I'm sure not going back. Come on, let's be a people who are moving forward. Let's be a people who are moving forward. Come on, let's be a people who are moving forward. Verse 5, it says, Then Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole Israelite assembly that was gathered there. Moses and Aaron were like, oh, we are in trouble. And Joseph, Joseph, Joshua, rather, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jeph Jephunneh, you pronounce it, The son of Jeff, who were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes and said to the entire Israelite assembly. So, so now Joshua and Caleb are getting a chance to speak. 
See what it says right there? It says, they said, they said, they said, they said to the entire Israelite assembly, the land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. And if the Lord is pleased with us, he'll lead us into that land. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. He'll give it to us. Do not rebel against the Lord. Do not be afraid of the people of the land because we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Come on, touch three people and say, he's with you. 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 Do not be afraid of them, the people, the inhabitants, the people who are standing in and opposing and resisting you from entering into God's dream, God's plan, God's vision, God's purpose for your life. Do not be afraid of those people. God's with us. Greater is he who is in us than he that is in the world. Amen. Amen. But the whole assembly talked about stoning them. Then the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to all the Israelites, and the Lord said to Moses, How long will these people treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe in me? In spite of all the signs that I've performed among them, all the things that God's done in your life, how long are you going to doubt, grumble, complain, murmur, worry, go back to Egypt? Overthrow the godly leadership and start a new caravan, head back to Egypt. How long, how long, how long will these people treat me this way? And for time's sake, the next six or seven verses, you can kind of glance at it yourself if you've got your Bible there with you or you're scrolling down on your phone or whatever you're re- using to read this morning. Moses begins to reason with God. He says, God, if you abandon us now, you brought us out of Egypt. You did all this. You spent all that time and energy, God, bringing us out of Egypt. Don't abandon us now. Or else Egypt will look and say, look, God wasn't able to complete what he, what he started. And he, he reasons with God. And picking up in verse 19, he says, Moses speaking to God says, In accordance with your great love, forgive the sins of these people, just as you have pardoned them from the time they left Egypt until now. He's saying, oh, we're, we, we messed up. We are messed up. And all along you've been forgiving us, so, so forgive us now. But something's gone to another level. They begin... Not just having thoughts about maybe it would be better to go back to Egypt. They began speaking with their mouth. Let's go back. And the Lord replies in verse 20 and he says, I have forgiven them as you asked. Nevertheless, as surely as I live and as surely as the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth, not one of those who saw my glory and the signs that I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, but who disobeyed me and tested me ten different times, Not one of them will ever see the land that I promised on an oath to their ancestors. And not one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. But because my servant Caleb has a different spirit, because he has a different spirit, because he has a different spirit, come on, we're breaking free, we're not conforming to the patterns of the world, because Caleb has a different spirit, come on, we are called as the people of God to have a different spirit. And he follows me wholeheartedly. Come on, that's what we're, that's, that's what I'm, I'm preaching and imploring you, let's prioritize. Let's pursue more of God in this season. I will bring him into the land that he went to, and his descendants will inherit it. Inherit it. Listen, we're we're saved by grace, but we're transformed by the renewing of our mind and the direction. Come on, we're, we're headed to heaven only because of the blood of Jesus. There's nothing else that we could do to earn it, deserve it, whatever. It never was about us. It's all about Jesus. But the direction of your life on this side of heaven and the quality of the life that you experience is largely going to be shaped by the thoughts you think that lead to the words you speak. That develop the the actions that inspire the habits that form and shape the character that is either preparing you or holding you back from God's destiny that he has for you. And so, so something shifted, something changed here. And God said, I've forgiven them, but nevertheless, it's going to affect their life. I've heard what they've been speaking, and watch how God just sums this up. This is one of the most powerful scriptures in all of the Bible to me. Listen, I'm telling you, people of God, this is important. You you can have a thought. You can have a bad day. But you better be careful about about what you say. Come on, someone ought to tweet that. (laughs) You can have a bad day, but watch what you say. You can have some thoughts. I mean, you you can't control the thoughts that are going to fly through your mind, but I'm telling you, people of God, you can control the ones that build a a roost, build a nest in your mind. 
You can have a bad day, but be careful what you say. Watch what, watch, watch what the, the living God says to Moses right here in verse 28. Moses has reasoned with him and said, come on, God, we know, I mean, see us through. Watch what he says. He says, so tell them, Moses, go back, go back and tell them. You got to tell them. Go back and tell them, Moses, as surely as I live. And come on, when the living God says something like that, he wants you to understand he's meaning, he means business. And he says, as, so, as sure as I live, declares the Lord, I will do to you what? The very thing that I heard you say. I'll do to you what? No. The very thing that I heard you say, it's going to happen to you. Listen, Joshua and Caleb probably had some of the same thoughts. I'm just telling you. Because I, 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 here's, here's how I know. Because they were human and because the devil is a liar. And every one of us, he's going to come to your life and he's going to come to your mind and he's going to speak. Can God really do what he said he's going to do? Is God really taking you where he said he's going to take you? And I promise you, Joshua and Caleb experienced those same thoughts. But they applied the principle that came out in the New Testament, and they took captive those thoughts through the obedience of God. And they said, not today, Satan, not today, devil. Our God is exceedingly great, and the land that he's called us to is exceedingly good. We're not going to be afraid of those people who are standing on that place trying, to, trying to, to intimidate us and put fear in our hearts. We're moving forward to the things that God has for us. They took captive those thoughts, and they began to speak by faith. They were convinced in their heart that their natural circumstances did not dictate their future. Who God is and what God said uh, reigns supreme in their life. Yep. Come on, it's true for you and me today. The enemy's going to come. He's going to lie. He's going to tempt. He's going to intimidate. He's going to try to create fear. And I'm telling you, once again, you can have a bad day. Be careful what you say. Surely as I live, I'll do the very thing that I heard you say. Listen, Proverbs 18, 21 says, death and life are where? In the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit. Pastor T, are, are, are you saying that, are you saying that, that, that what we say matters about the direction of our life? Yes, I'm saying that. Oh, you know what? I'm not saying it. God's word is saying it. I'm just telling you what he told me to tell you. Death and life are in the power of your tongue. Listen, I'm just telling you, people of God, we, we got to break free of the pattern of the world. We got to have a different spirit. We got to be able and willing to do what God's word says if we want to get different results than the world is getting. We get those thoughts that come into our mind. We got to take them captive. You cannot allow a thought to begin to run rampant and become a word. Thoughts become words. Words become actions. Actions inspire habits. Habits shake, shape your character. And your character is preparing you for your destiny. You have to watch. You have to guard. You can have a bad day, but watch what you say. It's affecting the direction of your life. Whether you know it or not, it is. Two, it's affecting the quality of your life and your relationships. And most of us are real familiar with the fact that death and life are in the power of the tongue. But look at the scripture right before in verse 20. And it says, a man's stomach, Proverbs 18 this is, a man's stomach shall be satisfied from what? The fruit of his mouth. From the produce of his, what? His lips. He shall be filled. For death and life are in the power of the tongue. Those who love it will eat its fruit. Those who, those who appreciate it, those who understand this concept, those who are willing to take ownership of what God is trying to say to us as his people and begin to discipline and train up our tongue, begin to guard our, our tongue, begin to watch what we say, begin to be mindful about what we say. He said, those, those who love it, those who appreciate that, you're going to eat the fruit. And let me just tell you, you're, you're eating the fruit one way or the other. But it's affecting what you're speaking. Are you speaking life or are you speaking death? Are you speaking doubt? And fear, or are you speaking faith? Are you speaking hope and encouragement, or are you speaking discouragement? Are, are you speaking something that unifies, or are you speaking something that divides? Life and death are in the power of the tongue. A man's stomach shall be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth. Listen, in, in, in your, your words are affecting the direction and the quality of your life. And listen, in your relationships, in our relationships, perhaps nothing represents uh, the, the quality of our relationship, like, like the way we communicate with people. I'm just telling you, you can, you can think you love someone, and you can, you, can, you can have it in your heart. Well, I love that person. I love my wife. What really matters is what you say. 
What you say is, 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 is determining the direction and the quality of that relationship. And Ephesians chapter 4 says it so clearly and so plainly. And it says, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. But only, say only. only. Say only. only. Only such a word as is good for edification, building up, building up according to the need of the moment. So that it will give grace to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Come on, that, we, we, we take that scripture and we use it independently. It's in the context of the words that we speak. Are the words that we're speaking, are they grieving the Spirit of God? Or are they pleasing to the Spirit of God? When we speak, we have a choice. We're either partnering with, with the devil who wants to kill and destroy, or we're partnering with a God who wants to bring life and resurrect people back to life. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't let any unwholesome word come out of your mouth. But only such a word is as good for the building up according to the need of the moment. Listen, can I let you in on a deep, profound secret of the Bible? Can we agree that God's word says that let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth, but only that which builds people up? Can we agree that God's word says that? Come on, if you agree with that, let me see your hand this morning. Come on, we agree God's word says that. Come on, you all, I got almost all of you on the record. Now, 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 let me let you in on a deep, this is a deep, profound mystery of the Bible. You got to go back to the root language to really unpack this. You ready for it? That scripture applies to your spouse. It applies to the way you speak to your spouse. It applies, here's another one, it applies to the way you talk about your boss. Why is it, come on, why is it, we can read that, why is it that the people that we care the most about, why is it that the people that are closest to us often get the worst of us? You know what I'm saying? You guys know what I mean? You can, ha you can be having a bad day and you're still, I mean most of us, for the, mo for the most part, most of you, you could be having a bad day and you'll still treat the gal at Starbucks nice. You could be having a bad day and you'll still treat the, the, the gas station attendant kindly. But then, boy, when we get home, come on, you know, who, who knows what I'm saying? Or is it just me? Is it just me and the way Amity treats me? <laughs> Gotta preach to these people over here. I can feel laser eyes like burning a hole in my shirt. Listen, I'm going to make a powerful statement. You might not have a marriage problem. You might have a mouth problem. Let me say it a different way. You don't have a problem with your big fat spouse. You have a problem with your big fat mouth. Come on, someone ought to tweet that out too. No unwholesome word. No unwholesome word. Only which is good for building someone up, building someone up, building someone up, building someone up. Listen, you'd be surprised. Your circumstances don't have to change for you to begin to speak life. Come on, we, as the people of God, we're called to live not by sight, but by, by, by how? By faith. We live by faith, not by sight. Can I let you in on another deep, profound secret of the Bible? That applies to every area of our life, not just money and healing. You're called to speak by faith. Listen, you, you will be surprised. Your situation and circumstances don't even have to start changing, but if you'll begin to speak life over your spouse, in the midst of the challenges, in the midst of the difficulty, come on, I'm just telling you. If you begin to say, God, I understand this thing has got power in it. It's got life and death. I understand that this thing is like a rudder of a ship. It's steering. It's charting a course, a direction for my life. And your word says that no man can tame it, but I, I, I'm not just here on my own. I've got the power of God on the inside of me. I'm empowered and filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Lord, would you begin to grace me, to strengthen me, to begin to speak life? Listen, you would be surprised at how your marriage might just start to come back to life. 
go back to the place where you got off track and started kind of dropping hints about divorce or infidelity. Go back to the place where you began to kind of speak more about the things that frustrate you or disappoint you or kind of aggravate you about your spouse more than you were speaking and exhorting and encouraging them and showing appreciation for the things that are good about them. Go back to that place and just begin to speak life. And just watch. Just watch. Your marriage will start to spring back to life. There's power in this thing. There's power in this thing. Every word we speak, come on, if the pathway to your life vision is paid by daily decision, can I just tell you, you, you have a decision to make about the words you speak. Every moment is an opportunity to, to just say, Lord, would you begin to put a Holy Spirit filter on my tongue? Would you begin to help me to, under, to really just line up? Is what I'm saying fit into Ephesians 4.29? Does it fit into, is this, is this unwholesome or is this going to build someone up? Come on, let me just give you a few things, just a little qualifying test. Is this life or death? Is what I'm about to say, is this faith or fear? Is what I'm about to say encourage me, encouraging or discouraging? Is what I'm about to say building someone up or tearing them down? Is what I'm about to say uh, going to draw out the goodness of God that's imparted and planted, the seeds of goodness and greatness that are in this person? Or is it going to throw dirt on it? Is what I'm about to say complaining and criticizing or is it expressing gratitude and appreciation? It's time for the people of God. It's time for the church of Jesus Christ to begin to rediscover our voice. It's time for us to begin to sound different. It's time for us to, like Joshua and Caleb, to have a different spirit. It's time for us as the people of God to take it seriously, the call and the command to not conform to the pattern of the world, the customs and behaviors of the world, but to begin to think and to begin to sound differently. Come on, would you stand to your feet this morning, people of God? This is important. This is important. G these are red letter words in your Bible. If you've got a version that has it as such, these are where the words of Jesus is what I'm trying to say. In Matthew 12, verse 36, he said this, I tell you that, listen, this is Jesus. Red letter words. They're all from God, but this is important right here. You better listen to this. We better listen to this. Jesus said, I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for in the day of judgment. For by your words, you will be justified. By your words, you will be condemned. This is important. This is important. Come on, we get saved with our words. The Bible says that we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth. This is powerful. You know, we talk about Jesus being the Lord of our life. You know, they asked him, they said, what's the greatest commandment? And you remember what Jesus said? He said that you would love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. Right? Didn't he say those four things? So it's easy to say, well, Jesus is Lord of my life. Let me ask you a different question. Is he Lord of your mind? Is he Lord of what you're thinking, which leads to what you're saying? Is he Lord over your tongue? Come on, is it possible that what we say, what we actually say is more important, more impactful to the direction and the quality of our life, and it's more, it has more to say and more to do with how God looks at our life and appraises our life than what we say we believe? It's time for what we believe to begin to come out in what we say. Aren't you grateful <laughs> that God knows every dark moment, every lustful thought, every misstep and failure he come on he knows that about me he was there in those moments there's nothing concealed from him he was, he was there in those difficult moments for you and yet he still calls you the apple of his eye he still calls you a son or a daughter he still says that you are not just a conqueror but you are more than a conqueror i don't know about you but i'm grateful how much more can we 
is a people who have been saved by grace and only by the grace of God begin to extend that same kind of grace to the people in our lives. Thank you, Lord. Come on, people, God, right there where you are, if you want to just say, Lord, would you become Lord over my mind and over my tongue this morning? I just want you to lift your hands before God, just right in front of you like this. Just say, Lord, thank you for reminding me or revealing to me this morning how significant and important this is. And Lord, I, 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 I need your help. I want your help. I need your empowerment. You acknowledge how challenging this is, but I can do it because I have your power. I have your strength. Give me your heart. Give me your mind. Begin to convict me when I have a thought that I'm tempted to allow to become a word. Begin to to, 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 to just remind me of this message. Begin to remind me and convict me, Lord. And in that moment, grace me to bridle my tongue. And Lord, help me re realize and remember that every word is an opportunity to make a decision. And my partnering with you in speaking life and, 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 and speaking encouragement and speaking hope, or is this word going to tear down or belittle? Is this word uh, uh, going to divide? Is this word going to destroy? And then, Lord, we just say... we. Give us, give us the grace, Lord, to begin to make different decisions. And thank you, Lord, that as we begin to speak life over, over people, thank you, Lord, as we begin to speak life over our spouse, thank you, Lord, as we begin to speak life over the, our, our, our co-workers, thank you, Lord, as we begin to speak life over every situation, every circumstance, Lord, thank you that, that we're going to begin to see things spring back to life. Come on, if you're here this morning and you realize that there have been some words that have been real used of the enemy to really be harmful and hurtful to someone. And a lot of times that does happen in relationships because we're so close to one another in relationships, in, mar in, in marriage rather. If that's you this morning, I just want you to just right there, just ask the Lord for forgiveness. Ask the Lord for forgiveness. Ask the Lord for a grace to go to your spouse and begin to take responsibility and begin to take ownership of some of those things that you said and ask them for their forgiveness. And, and to begin to commit one to another Let's begin to speak life. Let's begin, let's be reminded. Let's go back to that place where we got off track and let's begin to express our appreciation and our gratitude for one another. Let's begin to, to, to draw out the good things and let's begin to acknowledge those things and let's begin to prophesy over one another the things that God has for us in our future. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Come on, the most important thing we do before we close any services, give you an opportunity to respond to the free gift of salvation, who is Jesus Christ. If you're here this morning and you're far from God, maybe you once had a relationship with Jesus, but you've drifted. You're here today and you're a prodigal son or a daughter. You're far from him or you've drifted from him. Listen, let me tell you this morning, you are not here by accident. God is calling out to you. God is reaching out to you. God is speaking out to you that you matter, that you are my beloved, that you are my son, that you are my daughter. He's saying, come home. Come home today. Come home today. Run back to my arms. I'm waiting with my arms wide open. That's the heart of the Father for you this morning. And if that's you, you recognize that you're weighed down by the burden of your guilt and your sin. Today, the free gift of God is, is, is a washing, a cleansing, a forgiveness that we can only experience through Jesus Christ. And if that's you this morning, you fit in any of those camps, if that's you this morning, all I want to ask you to do is just respond by raising your hand in faith towards God. Come on, if that's you this morning, you're far from God, you're, or you're a prodigal son or daughter, thank you, Lord, for these precious people. Thank you, Lord, for these hands that represent hearts that are turning towards you. Thank you, Lord, for these hands that represent hearts that are coming home to you, God. Thank you, Lord. Come on, one more moment, and then we're going to pray together as, as all together as one church family. One more moment. If that's you this morning, just lift your hand high in the sky towards God. You're not responding to me. You're responding to God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for these precious hands. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, come on, church family. Let's pray this with everything we have in our heart this morning. It's a good reminder for us because it's true about us on every day. We never graduate from grace. But let's pray it. Come on, together with everything in our heart. Father, in Jesus' name, I recognize my need for a Savior. And I thank you for sending Jesus to pay the price I could not pay, to make a way that I might have a fresh start and a new life. 
I give you that life. I give you my trust. And I'll never be the same. Come on, say it one more time. I'll never be the same. Come on, one more time. I'll never be the same. Come on, let the people of God rejoice this morning. Thank you, God.